Well, joining us now on the line from Paris is Andrew Mould, senior economist at the OECD Development Center. Thank you so much for joining us. So are we talking here about shifting wealth or merely spreading wealth? Um, well, uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, I should just first say those figures that you cited actually are done in purchasing power parities. They're not market exchange rates. So it's depending how uh, the world economy is measured. But basically, the, the message of our report is there has been this shift in wealth, this shift in economic activity. And we're not seeing this as a zero-sum game. It's not a question of part of the world winning, winning at the expense of another part of the world. We're really talking about a positive story here where the dynamism of the emerging markets and uh, quite a number of developing countries has really changed quite significantly over the last decade. And so these developing countries are clearly going to have more protagonism in the future. And the latest IMF count shows developing countries having double the forex reserves in high income countries. Tell me, is that a factor in this assessment? Um, well, that's certainly one of the uh, consequences of this uh, shift in wealth scenario, certainly, yes. Um, now, of course, some economists consider actually uh, this vast buildup of foreign reserves as not exactly a first best policy option. Um, you know, because when you have developing countries with very high levels of foreign exchange reserves, and yet they have many uh, other expenditures which they should be spending this money on, um, then, then uh, the, such as education, health, infrastructure, for example, that this probably isn't the best outcome. But of course, it's a reaction of developing countries to the economic turbulence that they saw in the 1990s. This build-up really started after the Asian crisis in 1997. So it shows that a lot of developing countries are adopting very prudent macroeconomic strategies against this uh, global volatility. And what is your analysis of South-South trade and economic ties between developing countries going forward? Well, this is one of the things our report really focuses on because uh, we actually see the rise of uh, the large emerging countries, uh, India and China, but also countries as, such as Brazil and Indonesia, as being an opportunity for development for other developing countries in terms of increasing the intensity of these South-South links. Uh, we've seen South-South trade. Uh, rise very sharply over the last uh, two decades. And you also see this, of course, in increasing investment patterns in, of Chinese firms, Indian firms in, in Africa, for example, and in Latin America. And uh, we see these trends also increasing over the future in a positive way. Um, <clears throat> that would be mm. the basic uh, uh, now, thrust of our report. Yeah. If I could just ask you about China, because that country is now saying that it will keep the yuan steady on accelerating consumer prices last month, how might that impact on global trade imbalances? Um, well, of course, you know, the, the uh, issue of the exchange rate um, <clears throat> has been a, a source of certain tensions. Um, I, I would point to one thing, that China actually um, registered a trade deficit uh, uh, a couple of months ago, um, and although its trade balance over the year is, a, is, is still a large one, uh, Germany, for example, has a larger positive trade balance than China. Now, part of the interesting part of the China story is actual fact that uh, it, it's, of course, pulling in a lot of imports from the rest of the developing world. Um, <clears throat> you see that in the whole of the Asian regions. You know, so some mm -hmm. of the imports come in from high-income countries such as Japan and Korea, but. Many others also come in from developing countries such as Indonesia, Vietnam, and this has had a very positive impact on their development. So, so really the trade imbalance story is one of not particularly the United States versus China, but rather the United States versus the whole of the Asia region. So China in some circumstances is actually really acting mm. as a kind of funnel for, for exports from the region. Um, Nevertheless, the there seem to be a great many challenges ahead of these emerging market countries. What are the, what are the potential obstacles to the forecast that you're giving us? What are the possibilities of a potential implosion of growth in countries like China and India? Well, you know, uh, the, 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 the prospects of a positive outcome for the rest of the developing world obviously clearly depends on, on growth being maintained in India and China. And, um, yeah, I mean, if, if growth was to implode there, that would have been catastrophic, for example, during this last uh, financial crisis as well, because really these two large economies have acted as a bit of a shock absorber for the rest of the global economy. Um, we, we can't foresee what will happen over the next five or ten years to these growth processes. But broadly speaking, we think 
think that um, you know these changes, this shift in the global yeah. economy, is an irreversible one. We're not going to see it going back to the way it was before, and that requires all kinds of yeah. change in the policies of other developing countries because that's really the focus of our policy of our, of our report. Sorry, the, our report is really looking at what other developing well, countries should do in the face sure. of the rise of India and China. Well, thank you ever so much for your time. We do appreciate it, Andrew Mould, OECD senior economist.